Hi, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name's Nicole Yip, um, and I'm joined here by Robert Leckie, um, and we're the co-curators of the Donald Rodney exhibition. Um, I actually used to work here <laughs> and uh, started working with Robert on this exhibition about four years ago or so. So it's been a long time coming. Um, but we thought we'd just start out here. Um, I'll say a few words to introduce the exhibition and the artist, then we'll move into the galleries and have a look at, at the work. Um, so this exhibition is the first um, kind of in-depth and comprehensive survey of the work of Donald Rodney. Um, it's a pretty special exhibition, I think, for us, because the last kind of major show of Rodney's work was back in 2008 um, on the 10th anniversary of his, his death. And so, you know, I think since then there's been a whole generation of artists and curators who've read about his work, seen images of his work on the internet, but never actually experienced it in person. And as I hope you'll sense when you, when you enter the galleries that the, the actual, the, the physical experience of the work is really, um, is really powerful. Um, so it, this project sort of began um, with a selfish intention, which was uh, to bring together the work so that we could see it. But um, we, we hope that you know, we're also enabling um, a new generation of, of audiences and enthusiasts to, to see the work um, in person. Um, Donald was an artist who was born in the West Midlands in West Bromwich um, in the early 60s. Um, and he was born to parents of Jamaican descent. Um, they came over to the UK in the late 50s as part of the Windrush generation. Um, Donald was the youngest of 12 children, um, and I think the only one who was born in the UK. Um, he studied his foundation uh, in Bourneville and then came to Nottingham uh, in the early 80s and 81 to study uh, fine art at Trent Polytechnic, now known as Nottingham Trent University. Um, so there's a very con direct connection to the context here in the city. Um, and while he was there, um, he sort of came to prominence as one of the founding members of the Black Art Group. And I'm sure some of you may remember um, an exhibition we did, well, quite a few years ago now. And I say we, they, not in contemporary, did um, several years ago, uh, called The Places Here. I think that was in 2017, um, which was one of the first exhibitions to sort of tell the story of the Black Art Group and, his, and its origins in the region. Um, and from there, Donald went on to study at Slade in London, and um, you know his, his career was certainly on the rise, but was uh, cut short at the age of 36. Um, Donald suffered from a, a blood disorder called sickle cell anemia. Um, and so he, yeah, he died. Um, very young, sadly. Let's go into the galleries. So in terms of themes, um, Donald's work was wide ranging, but it was thinking a lot about Britain's colonial past, thinking a lot about the representation of black masculinity particularly, and also trying to deal with his experiences of chronic illness. Um, it's interesting to note that when he was a student in Nottingham and he met Keith Piper, who is now very involved with the Don Rodney estate, together with Diane Simmons, who's um, Donald's partner, um, and who've been really foundational for this exhibition happening at all. Um, he met Keith and, uh, and Keith introduced him to Eddie Chambers and that's how the Black Art Group connection was made. But, um, but Donald talks about having painted flowers, basically, when he was a student at Bourneville. And so coming to Nottingham, he describes his work getting kind of more political and quote unquote blacker in terms of its themes. And one of the earliest surviving paintings, um, which is here, um, is called How the West Was Won. And it's a kind of demonstration of Donald beginning to think through some of the kind of themes in relation to power dynamics, colonial history that would become central to many of his other works later in his life. Um, and I think another thing to say more broadly about the show is also that it spans many different mediums. And so Donald worked with painting, he worked with photography, with technology, animatronics, digital media, and you'll get a sense of that throughout, um, throughout the exhibition. And as Nicole said, you know, having died so young, it's really astonishing to 
us and many of the other people that encountered Donald's work that he was so actively engaged with so many different mediums and constantly experimenting throughout his life. Um, so obviously in this work, How the West Was Won, you have um, the kind of cowboy and Indian figures. And I think it's fair to say that Donald was interested in these kinds of uh, tropes throughout his life. You have other works in the next room that are also looking at kind of like plantation erotica. So he made these collages looking at the kind of relationship between power dynamics between, you know, plantation owners and slaves or indeed Native Americans and, and, and colonizers. Um, and then there's also this work that's from a little bit um, later, from 89, and it's based on a work by David Hockney, which is called We Two Boys Together Clinging. And that's originally from 1961, when Hockney was a student at the Royal College of Art in London. Um, and in the Hockney version, you have this kind of like uh, magnetic kind of vibration between your two young men in an embrace. Um, and in Donald's version, you have again, the figure of the kind of cowboy and Indian. And this like friction of sexual tension that's present in the early Hockney work is transformed into this kind of like threat of violence. It has a much more kind of sinister undertone. This work here is, um, it's called Britannia Hospital 3. Um, and it's one of, a series of three works that were made, but only two survive. Um, they were made in the 80s. And as you'll see, the kind of the structure of them is quite unique in terms of the materials that they use and how they're put together in a grid. So it's a series of x-rays. Um, and interestingly, when we were talking to the estate about um, how Donald would go about getting x-rays in his day. He would literally buy them from hospitals, like in plastic bags for like a pound. So it's interesting to think that um, in this day and age with things like GDPR and other legislation that's in place, it would be pretty much impossible to do that. And so there's a whole bunch of work that went into kind of um, getting rid of any personal information that was present on the x-rays. Um, and I think formally, it's really, really interesting in terms of this use of like oil pastel on x-ray. It's a conservator's nightmare. So it's been a very interesting process to, uh, to work to try and, uh, yeah, kind of enhance the life of these works, which is also why, unfortunately, in this iteration, only one of the two surviving works is able to be shown because of light exposure levels and things like that. Um, but it also demonstrates the fact that Donald was constantly coming up with ingenious ways to get round the challenges um, of his increased increasing disability as a result of his illness. So he was in a wheelchair for large parts of his life. He was in and out of hospital constantly. And he also had a lot of um, lack of mobility, particularly in his arms. So he wasn't able to work um, at large scale on large scale canvases because he couldn't reach. So he would kind of map things out in his sketchbooks in this grid format and then translate it to the grid on x-ray. Um, and Britannia Hospital refers to a film by a director called Lindy An Lindsay Anderson that was made in 1982. Um, and it's a kind of like uh, black comedy looking at like the workings of a hospital in Thatcherite Britain. Um, and you have these different figures that appear in Rodney's version. So you have a, someone from the Special Patrol Group, a notorious kind of police agency at that time, the patient, presumably Rodney on the bed, the immigrant nurse, and also this figure, um, which comes from a Frida Kahlo painting um, called La Columna Rotta, the, the, the broken spine. Um, and this is a kind of a, a figure that appears in various kind of places in Donald's sketchbooks and notes. And I think Frida was uh, a, an interesting figure for Donald because she made a lot of work about kind of her own experiences of, of, of pain, kind of both emotional and physical. Um, and so kind of appears in this work and in other aspects of, uh, of Donald's writing and thinking. So um, on the end wall here, you have another uh, work made with x-rays. This is called um, The House That Jack Built, and it's from 19... 88, <laughs> um, which I think is the same, same year as, uh, same period as this. Um, he describes this work as a, a self-portrait. And self-portraiture is something that he returned to time and time again throughout his career. And it's something maybe we'll talk a little bit more um, about as we 
move into the next room and um, look at some of the works which really explore um, kind of ideas around the image of the black of the black male um, and the kind of representations and racial stereotypes around that. Um, this work, I think, is particularly interesting because, um, as you can see, the you know it's it's made up of um, X rays um, uh, made into the shape of a house, but it's um, got these cutouts and stencils of hands and scissors, um, and and this this kind of text which talks about the kind of pathologies of colonialism and kind of invokes the language of Pan-Africanism, which he was very influenced by. He was very influenced by people like Marcus Garvey. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, Pan-Africanism um, is very broadly speaking a movement that sought um, to unify all um, people of African descent from all across the world. I mean, there's much more to say about that, but that's it in a nutshell. Um, but I think this is interesting because this was really um, the beginning of his experimentation with unsettling or fragmenting the picture plane. And he talks about this a lot, this kind of desire to disturb the surface um, in order to look at what's, what lies beneath. And so this is also um, you know, part of the reason why he was interested in, in, in uh, using x-rays and to explore the kind of creative and metaphorical um, potential of, of the x-ray as, you know, as, as a, um, a ground that speaks about the body, about fragility, but also about, you know, the desire to sort of see through um, a surface to look at the structures underneath. And so um, he was kind of using this in an allegorical way as well to kind of um, look through the surface of our lives at, to, to scrutinize the, the kind of underlying structures of society that structure life. Um, and you know, this is very much in the context of you know, the Thatcherite 80s, where there was just pervasive um, systemic racism that really sought to estrange black subjectivities and to reinforce white supremacy. Um, in, in front of this uh, backdrop, you have uh, this kind of scarecrow-like effigy um, which I think for me carries echoes of the histories of lynching. And sure enough, um, if you look in the top corner there, you, you see the noose. Um, so yeah, I think that's all there is to say about that. Um, I'll just um, bring your attention to these drawings here. These are quite special. These came directly from a box under Diane Simmons' bed <laughs> from the archive, and they've never been shown before, but they are some of the test drawings that um, Donald was doing, um, you know, I suppose, as, uh, as preparatory work for these larger pieces that you have behind you. And uh, in the vitrine, um, we have a, a, a selection of archive material. Um, we really wanted the show to speak primarily through the work. Um, but we also wanted to bring, um, bring it into dialogue with some kind of rare archive material that supports um, some of the biographical context as well as these connections between different themes and ideas that you'll find throughout um, the show. Um, so here you have some material that kind of harks back to his time at Trent. You have um, his, his yearbook from, I think, 84, 85. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in sort of kind of getting a sense of Donald's personality and the politics that really drove his work. Um, there are some really interesting statements. He often wrote these kind of artist statements um, that really, yeah, I think give voice to the way in which his time at Trent helped him find his political voice. Because as Robert said, prior to that, he was making flower paintings. <laughs> Um, and it's quite interesting. I was um, just refreshing my memory on the train up today and reading this quote by Donald where he um, kind of originally said that he wanted to be a black Picasso initially. And that was not because he was interested in foregrounding his experience of being black at all, but he just wanted to be famous. <laughs> um, and it was only at Trent that, and through his encounters with, with people like Keith Piper and Eddie Chambers, 
that he came to realize that he really wanted to make art that came from his own experience. Um, and, and so um, I think a lot of that comes through in the material in, in, in this vitrine here. So you'll see here this work on the three slide projectors is a work called Cataract from 1991. And it was first shown at a gallery in London called Camera Work. Um, alongside a couple of other of the works uh, that are on this side of the gallery. Um, and this is quite a special work for us in that it's not been shown since. So we've gone through a process of kind of reconstructing it in order to present it here in something close to its original format. As Nicole said before, in relation to the work that House of Jack built with the kind of scarecrow figure in front of it in the previous room, um, it's also looking at uh, self-portraiture and again, obviously specifically the representation of images of black men. Um, there are actually aspects of Donald's face that appear in this one, but again, this kind of reference to self-portraiture is, um, is kind of oblique. And the interesting thing to note also, just to mention it about the house that Jack built is also that it, in that work only the x-rays are actually of Donald's chest. Um, so again, this kind of like a oblique approach to self-portraiture really comes through. Um, this work here is called Visceral Canker. So this is the work that we titled the show after. Um, and you'll see um, it's made up of these kind of ingenious mechanisms that um, bring together the coats of arms of Sir John Hawkins, who was a slaver, and Queen Elizabeth I, um, together with this system that pumps theatrical blood. This was first shown um, in Plymouth in an old military battery overlooking Plymouth Sound. And when Donald wanted to um, present the work, the council intervened because he originally wanted to include his own blood um, because he wanted to create this link between, um, you know, histories of slavery and his own kind of identity, but also thinking through very much, yeah, his kind of medical experiences and the way in which, you know, he was constantly on drips, surrounded by tubing. And it really demonstrates how this kind of, this constant experience of hospitalization really in a very clear and direct way, incorporated itself into Donald's work. Um, but yeah, the council intervened and said he couldn't do that. So then it's been substituted with, um, with theatrical blood. Um, and this work recently entered the collection of the Tate Britain. Um, just to add, so the, the two plaques that you have here um, show the coats of arms of Sir John Hawkins, who was the first slave trader to sail from Plymouth. Um, and you can see on his coat of arms, um, there's even a depiction of, of three black men in collars. And then on the other side, you have the coat of arms of Queen Elizabeth I, who um, not only funded his, John Hawkins' enterprise, but also um, granted use of one of her largest ships, specifically for the purpose of trafficking enslaved Africans um, to be sold in the Spanish colonies. So, I think this work really gives kind of graphic form to these historic allegiances that kind of sanctioned the enslavement of black people and um, their trade across the Atlantic for years to come. And here we have a group of works which uh, continue to expand uh, Rodney's exploration of ideas of black masculinity. And he was particularly interested um, in media representations of black athletes and the ways in which the kind of politics of race and sport can collide. Um, and he was, I think, really perplexed by the way in which, you know, black athletes could be celebrated so enthusiastically on the sporting, on the sporting pitch, but at the same time kind of vilified on the street. And so these, these um, two light box works depict um, an image from the 1968 Mexico Olympics, um, where you have two US athletes doing the black power salute. Um, and this image from 20 years later shows um, the Liverpool footballer, John Barnes, um, sort of back heeling a banana, which has just been thrown at him on the pitch. Um, and then on this end wall here is a work that is not 
unrelated to cataract the slide um, presentation there. This group of works, they were all produced for an exhibition uh, called Cataract at Camera Work in London in 1990. One. 91. <laughs> um, but these are um, all found images of black men taken from the Evening Standard, Sunday Times, um, and this bottom uh, image is one of those kind of police identikit kind of um, reconstructions. And I think what's sort of interesting about this work, which is titled um, Self-Portrait, Black Men, Black Man, Public Enemy, is of course it's titled Self-Portrait, but it doesn't show Rodney himself. And I think he was um, sort of much more interested in the generic image of the black man. And um, I remember reading him saying that he didn't really want to use a direct image of himself because it felt far too heroic. And so it's kind of interesting to think about his strategy of, of dealing with these issues of, of racial stereotyping where he's not kind of confronting it by trying to present a kind of heroic counter image um, of you know, the black man as a, a counter image to this idea of the black man being a threat or an enemy um, or a criminal in, you know, even. Um, but he's really kind of working with the stereotype in order to critique it and in order to expose the mechanisms and the ideological, ideological intentions behind the way in which these images were used and circulated. Um, so it's like, yeah, I guess this idea of displacing a sort of stereotyped image by exposing the way in which it's effective, um, which I think is an interesting strategy. Just a couple more things to say on these is that um, Eddie Chambers, who is a member of the Black Art Group and has written extensively on Donald's work, has also talked about this work being kind of reminiscent of like a holy cross. And you will um, see other works later that kind of bring to the fore uh, this kind of religious aspect of Donald's practice. Um, and finally, I also just want to pick up on the kind of formal point that we made earlier, which is that um, there's something fascinating to me about the construction of these works and how they incorporate images, but also how they really lay bare the mechanics of how the light boxes are put together and how this kind of mirrors this work, Visceral Canker, that's on the other side of the wall. Um, so again, just a kind of demonstration of this kind of constant formal ingenuity in Donald's work as it develops over time. Okay, so this work is called Flesh of My Flesh, um, and it's made up of three panels. The central panel, um, is an image of Donald's right thigh um, after surgery. Um, so this uh, large raised scar. And then the other images are microscopic images um, of human hairs. And one is Donald's own hair. And the other is a strand of hair of an artist called Rose Finn Kelsey. Um, who was a white female artist that Donald had also attempted to kind of collaborate and make work with, um, albeit unsuccessfully after they made this work together or, or she participated in this work. Um, and so, yeah, there's kind of several things going on in this, but obviously the, uh, the immediate thing is to demonstrate that at this microscopic level, there is fundamentally no difference between uh, these two uh, types of hair which are kind of in in popular culture or in racial stereotypes often kind of described or thought of as very very different um, and also the central image is this kind of uh, yeah demonstration i guess of the politics underlying um donald's experiences of uh, hospitalization and obviously um, undergoing surgery. So someone um, called Virginia Namarco, who wrote a really great essay on Donald's work in a book called Double Think that was published in 2003 by Autograph in London, um, writes about this uh, being a kind of demonstration of uh, medical malpractice and the fact that there's an assumption by a white doctor who undertook the surgery that black skin is somehow tougher than white skin and therefore doesn't require the same kind of delicacy and attention um, when it comes to being sewn back up. And this work was made in 1996, and it was first shown 
in an exhibition at the Barbican called Body Visual. Um, and this was a show that was looking, generally speaking, about uh, the overlap between art and science. Um, and kind of gives an indication of the kinds of contexts that Donald's work was being shown in. The biggest um, exhibition that he had towards the end of his life um, was a survey at the South London Gallery, which was in 1997. Uh, and so many of the works that you'll see throughout the next two rooms were kind of produced specifically for this exhibition. Uh, and it gives you a sense of like the incredible uh, speed and passion with which Donald carried on making work even towards the end of his life. Behind me are some of the uh, test images or working material that Donald um, produced uh, in the lead up to Flesh of My Flesh. And it's, um, it's interesting to, to have a closer look at these. You can see uh, some of these are even uh, annotated. So this one is, um, says black and this one says white. Um, again, trying to kind of unpick these mythologies of, of racial difference at a microscopic level. Um, and then here you have the three original images that were used to produce um, the triptych, the final triptych. So as Robert mentioned, um, many of the works in these two rooms were produced for Rodney's what would be the final exhibition of his life, um, an exhibition at South London Gallery at, entitled Nine Night in El Dorado. Um, the exhibition title refers to um, a Jamaican um, sort of tradition of mourning the dead over the period of nine nights. Um, Rodney's father, Harold, passed away in 1995, which was around the time that Donald was invited to make this exhibition. Um, Donald was unfortunately too, night, too, too ill to participate in his father's nine night. And I think this kind of absence came to really shape the way he thought about um, the works for this exhibition. Um, so you have ideas of kind of family, home, belonging, um, a certain kind of intimacy. And I think also um, just to sort of trace the trajectory of works that we've encountered so far that you know, as Donald became increasingly bedridden, the work it sort of marks a shift in the work, which began as being quite overtly political um, to being actually much more personal about this kind of interior space, about his reflections of the black body in, in, in a state of perpetual crisis because of um, the ongoing um, spells of illness that he went through. Um, this particular work, I'm going to talk about this one first. <laughs> um, this is a, a beautiful sculpture um, made of Donald's um, own skin, which was um, taken from his body after uh, a, a major hip operation. But um, if you look up close, it's a tiny house made of skin, held together very delicately by dressmaker's pins. Um, and for me, you know, this work obviously speaks about fragility, but it's also drawing these connections between sort of protective fabric of the skin and the protect, protective mechanism of fam the family and of home uh, and the way in which um, actually this is all so contingent and, you know, so fragile. Um, and this accompanying photograph um, shows the tiny sculpture, which is titled my mother, my father, my sister, my brother held in the artist's hand. And it was originally intended to be part of a diptych. Um, and its kind of unrealized companion would have shown this tiny sculpture um, on the artist's tongue, which I think we sort of, yeah, as you mentioned, there are these kind of religious overtones to a lot of the work. And so the unrealized companion obviously is suggestive of the Catholic ritual of communion. Um, and I think, you know, the church was very important to Donald's parents. They were very active and engaged members of the Jamaican Pentecostal um, church. And although I think Donald himself had maybe a more ambivalent relationship to religion in, more generally, 
um, his work often invokes the kind of the language um, and the mechanisms of, of the church and the liturgy, the liturgy um, and its kind of um, supporting narratives of exile, of belonging, and ancestorship. Um, around the side here, and I will encourage you to have a closer look after the tour, um, is, a, is a selection of 10 of Donald's notebooks. Um, drawing and writing was, a very, was very important to Donald, and he kept notebooks all throughout his life. Um, and these span a period from 1986 um, to his death. Um, and yeah, it, it, I mean, they contain notes, they contain drawings, they contain references. Um, and yeah, I'd encourage you to have, a, and also kind of signals to some of the other artists that Donald was looking at. You have here references to figures like David Wojnarowicz um, and, and others, um, but I think yeah, it just shows what an inquisitive mind Donald had. He was always, he had this kind of insatiable appetite. And even though he was bedridden, he was constantly looking um, at films, at literature, at other artists, um, at what was happening in the world around him, both in the UK and internationally. Um, I'll just point out, there's a work behind you, which um, is the working material for a piece called Soweto Guernica, which um, is actually one of the few pieces that refer directly to um, sort of uprisings that were happening around the world. So Soweto was one of the largest black townships um, just south of Johannesburg in South Africa. And it was sort of um, came to prominence in, in the 70s because of a, um, an uprising against apartheid. And um, yeah, so this, this work was made uh, in reference to that. The two works here were also made for the South London Gallery show, um, and they're titled Black Comedy 1 and 2. Um, the works actually um, come from a pair of earlier pieces made again for that 1991 show at camera work called Cataract, and they were originally titled Cartoon 1 and Cartoon 2. And they uh, reproduce cartoons from the sun, which kind of make a mockery of people who have experienced racism. So um, I think in this piece, the original cartoon um, depicts a choir on one side singing, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. And on the other side, it shows a kind of barrister announcing to a judge, the charge is racism. Um, and in this one, it shows, um, an, a family, a man in a turban astride a tiger, sort of striding through immigration at Heathrow, saying to his family who are behind him, see, I see, I, I told you we'd have no trouble getting through. Um, and for the South London Gallery exhibition, uh, Donald uh, whitewashed over these um, cartoon works in the manner similar to a billboard, leaving some areas of black filled in, um, but he sort of talks about these works as being modernist paintings, uh, kind of in the tradition of a Western art history that refuses to, that previously refused to acknowledge um, kind of influences from elsewhere, this kind of white intellectual culture that kind of um, saw itself as separate and distinct from, you know, um, uh, yeah, influences from, from anywhere else in the world. So the central work in this room is a piece called Psalms. Um, and as you can see, it's an automated wheelchair. Um, Donald works a lot with um, a good friend of his, a guy called Mike Phillips, um, to produce this work. And also the work Visceral Canker that we'd already saw next door that was originally installed, at, um, installed in Plymouth. Um, and yeah, this work was kind of roaming around the South London Gallery in 1997 um, at the opening of the exhibition that was, as Nicole's already mentioned, the kind of largest scale presentation of Donald's work um, ever to have taken place. And Donald was ill in hospital, like was very often the case. And so it kind of takes on this um, 
kind of presence of the artist moving around, um, making its kind of own decisions, occasionally bumping into things um, or people. Um, and so it's a really um, powerful work, I find, even now, um, thinking about the fact also that you know, Nicole and I never met Donald. Many, many people talk about having known him and having loved him, his sense of humor, his work and, um, and his ideas. And it also demonstrates the fact that m much of what Donald made throughout his life was only really made possible with the support of other people. Um, so there was a kind of informal network that were casually referred to as Donald Rodney PLC, which were a group of, um, of friends and acquaintances and healthcare professionals that would kind of assist Donald when he was in hospital, whether that's by kind of bringing, you know, newspapers and magazines, art magazines, kind of keeping him up to date with what's going on, or having conversations with him about the work, or indeed helping him to make it. Um, so I think this this work is a kind of nexus of all of these different relationships that um, that enabled Donald to produce the work. The work behind it is um, is a piece called My Catechism, um, and it's a series of plaster casts of the children's Encyclopedia Britannica, um, which Donald's father would collect from a door-to-door -door or buy from a door-to-door -door salesman that would come to the house. Um, and eventually uh, they got the whole set and Donald joked about the fact that it was literally the only thing that his dad would let him read. So again, these kinds of like references to like home, the family, his relationship with his father really come through in this work, which similarly to kind of black comedy one and two also references these kind of histories of modernism, because you could also think about it as a kind of uh, quite direct um, conceptual like modernist sculpture. Um, this work here um, is called Don is called Double Think, um, and it was originally shown at the Arnold Feeney in Bristol in an exhibition, a group exhibition called Trophies of Empire. Um, and to make the work, Donald collected um, these kinds of sports trophies, um, and he made new captions for them. Um, and the captions include lots of different um, offensive racist statements and Donald would refer to them as kind of being found in the most depressing sense. So he would talk about, you know, finding these, um, finding these things written in newspapers, hearing them on the bus or on the tube or when he's walking in the street. Um, and as Nicole was talking about previously in relation to the two light box works that were kind of drawing... Um, together these kind of histories of like sportsmanship and black sportsmen versus their kind of experiences in the world and the way that they're kind of perceived to be uh, you know and non-intellectual for example these kinds of statements are then replicated um on the trophy so you have this very direct kind of uh coming together of yeah celebration of sporting achievements and you know racial slurs and statements and the title double think it comes from 1984 by george orwell and it's this notion that one person can hold two contradictory thoughts or opinions in mind at once and believe both of them so this is the kind of origin of the title and finally just to finish this room um this is a video that i don't need to talk about much but it is interesting in that we came across it during our research and it is literally um an interview that donald did and a kind of presentation that he did to a group of school students in gloucestershire i think um somewhere near bristol i forget exactly where but um but we thought it was a really really important archival document because there's something about the um, kind of clarity and passion with which Donald talks about the work to a group of primarily younger white students um, and it, it feels really important to us to kind of have his voice present in the show as much as possible. There's another video next door that we didn't talk about which is a kind of portrait of Donald's life by Black Audio Film Collective which is also definitely worth watching um, but yeah there's th there's so much and it feels um, really key to us to have Donald's voice present in the show. Maybe just a final note on Donald's voice. Um, there's a work just at the entrance to the gallery there, um, which is on a computer. 
um, which I would invite you to, to sit down and, and have a play around with. It's, a it's an interactive digital work called Auto Icon, and uh, it was developed also with, with Mike Phillips, and it's a really interesting piece in the way it sort of, you know, it was made, it was conceptualized in the mid 90s, and it was only realized um, after his death with his support network, which were, who were called Donald Rodney PLC, um, ironically. Um, but I think, you know, Donald was very much aware of his own mortality. And so he had this idea to create a kind of virtual self that would outlive him. Um, and, and what we have is Auto Icon, which invites you to interact with it in a kind of um, text chat. And it will speak to you um, uh, and respond to you drawing on a set of data um, which comprises kind of um, interviews with the artist, images, texts um, about Donald. So it's, it's, um, it's surprising. Sometimes it responds in text. Sometimes it responds actually with audio, with Donald's voice. There's also different functions. So you can enter what's called the montage machine, which is interesting, which um, based on different sort of search terms will draw up um, a, a flow of images and to think about this, like in the late 90s, before the real kind of advent of the internet is, is really incredible. And I think just goes to show, you know, how, um, how prescient um, Donald was in anticipating um, not only the internet, but ideas around sort of machine learning and AI. So this final work um, is called Pygmalion. Um, and it was also made for the, 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 his final exhibition at South London Gallery. And it you know, obviously takes inspiration from those kind of seaside arcade figures of the Latin policemen. Um, but here Donald has adorned the laughing policeman with um, silver gloves, military jacket, and Jerry Curl wig, um, referencing uh, Michael Jackson. Um, but as you can see, he's slathered thick black paint on, on Michael Jackson's face. Um, which I think you know, is obviously a reference to the way, uh, the complicated relationship that Michael Jackson had with the color of his own skin. Um, but uh, yeah, is, it, you know, is, is yet another example of uh, Rodney's interest in exploring ideas around kind of media representation, around the construction of racial identity, um, as well as ideas around black masculinity.